Please welcome to the stage board member and vice president of Air Canada, Mr. Derek Fanstone. This uh, is my opportunity to get the meal onto its next step. I'm going to introduce uh, someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, Ambassador Bruce Heyman came to Canada. I, I had to count because it was about, I think, about six months ago. And, uh, and he and, and, and his uh, wife Vicky really have uh, made uh, tremendous strides in getting around the country and getting themselves known. They've become real permanent fixtures, not only here in Ottawa, but right across the country as, as President Obama's uh, representatives. Of course, we know that there was a, a slight delay in, in uh, Ambassador Heyman's uh, nomination, but I think uh, in the, the six months he's been here, we have long since forgotten the, the eight months where there was a, a slight gap, and, and it is my great honor to introduce him today. Most of you will know this, but uh, Bruce Heyman is originally from Dayton, Ohio. He made his way to Tennessee, attended Vanderbilt, served in, uh, earned an MBA where he met his fabulous wife, Vicki, who's great and here to join us today. They moved to Chicago where they became a key part of the Obama campaign juggernaut. And we here in Canada are very fortunate to have these insiders here in Ottawa. So I would ask you to join me in welcoming Bruce Heyman, Ambassador of the United States, to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Derek, Derek, thank you uh, for the warm introduction. It's so great to be here with uh, so many colleagues and friends, and especially the Canadian American uh, Business Council. Uh, CABC has a really a long history of bringing together government, business policy, thought leaders to address the important issues that affect uh, both of our countries. And we really are forging through CABC, a, um, uh, a real set of business links and dialogue that's important. So thank you so much uh, uh, for your efforts in today's program. So before I introduce uh, today's guest of honor, I, I wanted to say a few words regarding the United States-Canada relationship to set the stage for the rest of our discussions here today. First, let me reaffirm what we all already know. The United States and Canada are staunch allies, we're vital economic partners, and we're steadfast friends. We share common values, deep links among our citizens, and deeply rooted ties. The extensive mobility of people, goods, capital, and information between our countries has helped ensure our societies remain open, democratic, and prosperous. Second, the United States has no better economic partner than Canada. Together, we've built the largest bilateral trading relationship in the history of the world. I might as well say universe, but $735 billion, $2 billion every day, $1.4 million every minute. This two-way merchandise trade that Canada has with the United States has increased two and a half times since NAFTA's implementation. It's hard to think of a stronger example demonstrating our mutual and individual good. They're inseparable. And since the depths of the financial crisis, Canada-US two-way trade in goods and services have increased $235 billion or an increase of nearly 50%, proving that together the uh, Canada and the United States do great things. We defy odds. We build better lives for our people, and even in the face of the most daunting challenges. Third, the United States has no better security partner than Canada. There are a myriad of threats, both internationally and, yes, domestically, facing our great nations, and we are working tirelessly to protect our citizens at all levels of government. And certainly, the Department of Homeland Security is at the forefront of that mission, along with our partners in the Canadian government. We all owe much to your efforts, Mr. Secretary, in helping uh, provide safety and security for uh, both of our two countries. 
We know that moving people and goods efficiently is crucial for maintaining and expanding unprecedented trade. And we also know the challenge we both face is to manage our enormous and critical flow of cross-border trade while simultaneously ensuring that our borders are secure against those who would do us harm. And this brings me to my final point. We have taken steps to address this challenge through the United States, Canada, beyond the border. A shared perimeter vision for perimeter security and economic competitiveness signed by both President Obama and Prime Minister Harper in 2011. See, a fundamental principle behind the BTB, beyond the border, is the idea of doing as much as possible away from the border so that we can free up inspection resources at the border to focus on those who we have no information or who we think, based on advanced targeting, may pose some risk. This collaboration is achieving results, which I'm sure you will hear more about from the Secretary in just a minute. So one of the initiatives that I hear most about is the Trusted Traveler Program known as Nexus. And I hope you all have your Nexus cards, by the way. Nexus recently celebrated its one millionth member. But I think we should have two million or three million. We're working to increase membership while ensuring the integrity of the program. And it's a product with pent up demand, and we see that across the country here. It's truly transforming the way people travel across our shared border. You know, I've shared this story uh, before, but I'll share it again that, you know, during my travels through Canada, I had the chance to stand, stand at a CBP primary. Um, port, witnessing vehicles traveling through right at the Peace Arch in Washington State. And I introduced myself as the ambassador. A uh, few folks didn't think I was serious. Um, and I said, wow, this is really great. You've got the Nexus program here. It seems to be working. And they said, yeah, it's working. Don't tell anybody. I don't want anybody else in my line. <laughs> so with that backdrop, I have uh, I have the distinct honor to introduce uh, J. Charles Johnson this afternoon. Secretary Johnson was sworn in on December 23, 2013 as the fourth Secretary of Homeland Security. Prior to joining DHS, Secretary Johnson served as the General Counsel for the Department of Defense, where he was part of the senior management team and led more than 10,000 military and civilian lawyers across the department. Secretary Johnson's career has included extensive service in national security, law enforcement, and as an attorney in private corporate law practice. Secretary Johnson was the general counsel of the Department of the Air Force from 1998 to 2001. He served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York from 1989 to 1991. And in practice of law, he was a partner at the very prestigious New York City-based law firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. He was elected a fellow in 2004 in the prestigious American College of Trial Lawyers, and he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Secretary Johnson is a graduate of Morehouse College in 1979, received his law degree from Columbia University in 1982, and it's my distinct pleasure to turn the podium over to our Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Johnson. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? I think so. Um, you heard the ambassador say I used to be a lawyer with the law firm of Paul Weiss in New York. I look at the list of attendees here and I recognize many former clients among the firms you represent. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you here today. I appreciate the warm welcome to Ottawa and the hospitality from this business council. I welcome the opportunity to be here in Ottawa, your nation's capital, the Canadians here. I also welcome the opportunity to escape for a short period of time my nation's capital. <laughs> As my mentor and friend, the former Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, used to say, 
any day out of Washington is a good day. <laughs> this is my first trip to Canada as Secretary of Homeland Security. I've been in office for about nine months. I'd planned to come here for some time now. I'm here to continue to build the terrific relationships that my government and I enjoy with the ministers of this government. Given the number of shared interests that we have, it has taken me far too long to visit my next door neighbor in my new official capacity. But it is hardly my first visit to Canada. I recall when I was 10 years old visiting Expo 67 in Montreal. July 2007, 40 years later, my son, who was then 12 years old, had a passion for dirt bikes and dirt biking. And so his mother, my wife Susan, who's sitting over there, went online and found a dirt bike camp in northern Ontario. <laughs> we flew into Toronto. I recall driving the straightest highway I've ever driven in my life, about 150 miles up to this dirt bike camp in Ontario where I left my son off for three months, three weeks, <laughs> three weeks, it seemed like three months. He loved dirt biking. So when I picked him up three weeks later, he was covered in dirt. He had a really good time. He enjoyed dirt biking and he said, Dad, I was even knocked unconscious for a whole two minutes. <laughs> we did not return to that dirt bike camp. <laughs> Um, speaking of visits to my, with my kids, this past weekend, you may, may be interested to know, I, at the very last minute, decided to go visit my two kids who are now in college in Southern California. One's at Occidental College, the other one's at Scripps College. And I flew out there, and <clears throat> I'm under orders from my daughter when I visit her on her college campus. She's a freshman. Can you not be conspicuous, Dad? <laughs> you know, the entourage, the, the, the California Highway Patrol, I got to think about that. I'm just a freshman. I discovered this past weekend when I visited my daughter, my son was with us at, 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 at Scripps, that they have this thing, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm born, I'm like the ambassador, I was born in 1957, so I'm a, to my kids, I'm a relic of the past. And uh, I learned about something uh, a social media tool called Yik Yak. Anybody here ever heard of Yik Yak? It's a social media tool for kids on college campuses where they can text each other anonymously back and forth and just chatter on campus about stuff going on. And they chatter anonymously and furiously. And you pick it up on your iPhone. So within minutes of hitting the Scripps campus, Yik Yak lit up with the following, among many other texts. There are two Secret Service agents on campus. What's up? Obama is here. <laughs> Obama is not here. Calm down. <laughs> Malia is here. She's looking at us for college. Malia is not here looking at colleges. She's too young. Calm down. <laughs> then my son got into the act. He couldn't resist. He's getting the text, too. So my son jumps into the conversation. It's a Vin Diesel look-alike. <laughs> but why does he need a bodyguard? <laughs> Finally, no, it's the fake Obama, the chief of Homeland Security. His daughter is a freshman here. Hey, those guys have guns. Final text in the conversation. Too bad for his daughter. Now she'll never get a date for the next four years. <laughs> Can't make this up. In addition to speaking to you now today, today and yesterday, I, I'm, in here, I'm here in Ottawa, and I have the honor of visiting with Prime Minister Harper, Minister Raitt, Minister Alexander, and Minister Blaney. Last night, my wife and I attended a terrific dinner hosted by Ambassador Heyman and his wife with a number of cabinet ministers here. Our discussion reminded me of all we have in common, ranging from our shared interest in promoting trade to the potential threats we face to both our homelands. In the next few minutes, I'd like to tell you about the U.S. Department of Homeland Security 
and what we are doing today. Today, DHS is the third largest department of the U.S. government with 240,000 employees, 22 components, and a total budget authority of about $60 billion. The department has a broad and diverse set of missions. It is responsible for, among other things, counterterrorism, the administration and enforcement of our immigration laws, cybersecurity, aviation security, maritime security, border security, the security of our land and seaports, protection against nuclear, chemical, and biological threats to the homeland, protection of our national leaders, protection of our critical infrastructure, training of federal law enforcement personnel, coordinating the federal government's response to natural disasters, and emergency preparedness grants to state and local authorities. The 22 agencies or components that make up DHS include U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which by itself is the largest federal law enforcement agency in our country, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the Coast Guard, TSA, FEMA, and the Secret Service. In my view, counterterrorism must and will remain the cornerstone of the Department of Homeland Security's mission. Thirteen years after 9-11, it is still a dangerous world. But today, the terrorist threat is different from what it was in 2001. It is more decentralized and more complex. Not only is there core al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan, there is al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, al-Shabaab in Somalia, the al-Nusra Front in Syria, and the newest al-Qaeda affiliate, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. There are groups like Boko Haram in Nigeria, which are not official affiliates of al-Qaeda, but share its extremist ideology. Last but not least, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL, previously known as al-Qaeda in Iraq, is now vying to be the preeminent terrorist organization on the world's stage. Speaking for President Obama and our government, we are pleased that Canada is part of the international coalition that will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And we have asked Canada to make further contributions to this effort. To address the threats generally emanating from terrorist groups overseas, our government has in recent weeks enhanced aviation security. In early July, I directed enhanced screening at a number of overseas airports with direct flights to the U.S. Several weeks later, we added more airports to that list. Other countries have followed with similar enhancements to their aviation security. We continually evaluate whether more is necessary without unnecessarily burdening the traveling public. Longer term, we are pursuing pre-clearance at overseas airports with flights to the U.S. I am pleased that we have established pre-clearance capability at eight, eight airports here in Canada. We must be aware that since 9-11, the potential terrorist threat to both our homelands has evolved in new ways. Today, both our nations face the prospect of so-called foreign fighters who go to Syria. In February, I said that for the United States, Syria had become a matter of homeland security. Our government is making enhanced and concerted efforts to track Syrian foreign fighters who come from or seek to enter our country. The reality is that more than 12,000 foreign fighters from around the world have traveled to Syria over the last three years. We are concerned that not only may these foreign fighters join ISIL or other extremist groups in Syria, they may also be recruited by these extremist groups to leave Syria and conduct external attacks. Our FBI has arrested a number of individuals who have tried to travel from the U.S. to Syria to support terrorist activity there. We are committed to working with the Canadian government and others to build better information sharing to track Syrian foreign fighters. This is reflected in the UN Security Council resolution on foreign fighters passed last week. Second, we worry about the potential domestic-based, homegrown terrorist threat that may be lurking in our own society. 
the independent actor or lone wolf, those who did not train at a terrorist camp or join the ranks of a terrorist organization overseas, but who are inspired at home by a group's social media, literature, or extremist ideology. In the United States, we got an example of this type of actor last year at the Boston Marathon. In many respects, this is the hardest terrorist threat to detect and the one I worry about the most. Part of the way we are addressing the domestic lone wolf threat is to engage in outreach to communities in the United States which themselves are able to reach young men who may turn to violence. I personally participate in these programs. Last week, I visited an Islamic culture center in Columbus, Ohio for this purpose. With the help of community organizations in a position to touch those disaffected from society and who need something or someone to believe in, belong to, or worship, we are stressing that violence, terrorism, and groups such as ISIL are not the answer. We stress that despite its slick public media and its self-proclamation to be the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL is neither Islamic nor is it a state. Contrary to the misguided belief of some, ISIL is not defending Islam and it is not defending innocent Muslims. In fact, most of the people killed by ISIL are Muslims. ISIL is a stateless group of depraved criminals rapists, kidnappers, killers, and terrorists who control territory. There is no religion, including Islam, and there is no God, including Allah, that would condone ISIL's violent tactics. The good news for our country and yours, I believe, is that over the last 13 years, we have vastly improved our ability to detect and disrupt terrorist plots overseas before they reach our homelands. At home, both our law enforcement communities, in my judgment, do an excellent job time and again of identifying, investigating, arresting, and prosecuting scores of individuals before they commit terrorist acts. The bad news is we continue to face real terrorist enemies and real terrorist threats. All that said, I now turn to another major aspect of my job, facilitating lawful trade and travel at our borders and ports of entry. When John F. Kennedy visited Canada in 1961, the new American president noted how, quote, geography has made us neighbors, history has made us friends, and economics has made us partners, end quote. Legitimate cross-border trade and travel between the United States and Canada is crucial. Somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 people cross our shared border every day. As you heard the ambassador say, $735 billion in goods and services cross our shared border every year, or $2 billion a day, or if you do the math, 1.4 million a minute. 25% of all American exports come to Canada, the largest market of, for 35 of our 50 states. Canada sells 87% of its output to the United States, generating about 40% of your national income. Last year, Canada was the third largest source of foreign direct investment to the United States, its investment totaling $280 billion. In the car on the way over here, the ambassador told me that of every dollar of Canadian export, 25% is of U.S. content. The same year, the United States, the same year as last year, the United States was Canada's largest source of foreign direct investment, our investment totaling $368 billion. U.S. subsidiaries of Canadian firms employ 547,000 workers, mostly in the manufacturing sector, with an average wage of more than $65,000 annually. U.S. subsidiaries of Canadian-owned firms invest more than 500 million a year in research and development in the United States. When my country was attacked on 9-11, our first response was to raise all the drawbridges. Crossing points became choke points for cars and cargo. But thanks to the commitment and work of President Obama and Prime Minister Harper and the Beyond the Borders initiative they launched in 2011, 
our governments are making real progress in enhancing perimeter security and the economic competitiveness of our two countries. We're doing a better job and a more sophisticated job of keeping our borders open to trade but closed to terrorists and those who would do us harm. And we have achieved notable results that will improve the lives of the citizens, visitors, and businesses in both our countries. For example, together we have made improvements in and expanded the Nexus Trusted Traveler Program, which you all know about. These improvements at land border ports of entry have resulted in a more than 60% increase in membership and participation in Nexus since the announcement of the Beyond the Border initiative. Today, more than one million Nexus members are experiencing swifter and more expedient travel by gaining access to Canadian Air Transport Security Authority screening lanes at Canadian airports and the TSA pre-check program at U.S. airports. Access to additional lanes and kiosks at a greater number of ports of entry and a simplified renewal process. Second, we have developed a U.S.-Canada integrated cargo security strategy. This is intended to facilitate the movement of cross-border cargo under the principle of cleared once, accepted twice. We have also deployed an innovative joint entry-exit program at our common land border. This has meant that the record of entry into one country is shared and becomes the record of exit from the other country for third country nationals and permanent residents of both countries. This enhances the integrity of our immigration system and will do so even more when we expand the program to cover all travelers. I spoke about the importance of pre-clearance. We are nearing completion of a groundbreaking pre-clearance agreement that for the first time will cover pre-clearance in all modes of border crossing, land, rail, marine, and air, and creates a new legal framework for officers operating in each other's country. By any measure, we are partners in success. Our economies draw strength from one another, and that makes it even more important that we build predictability into our trading partnership by streamlining the import-export process with electronically transmitted data through a single window. Beyond the Border has allowed us to start harmonizing our data elements so we can eliminate duplication and burdensome paperwork to speed up the shipment of goods between our countries. The executive order signed by President Obama this year mandated this single electronic, this electronic single window. It is going to strengthen the North American economy and make us more competitive as a region. Our shared border is more than a simple geographical boundary. It is the site of more than 100 ports of entry, doors from one country to the other where the efficient movement of people and goods is crucial to the daily lives of our citizens, the health of our communities, and the competitiveness of our economies. As a result of the Beyond the Border initiative and the collaboration it has fostered, our countries today are stronger, safer, and more prosperous. Significant progress has been made, but I know work remains to comp be completed on some of the most ambitious goals of the Beyond the Border initiative. I like to tell U.S. audiences that homeland security means striking a balance. In the name of homeland security, I can build you a perfectly safe city, but it will be a prison. I can build more fences, install more invasive screening devices, ask more intrusive questions, demand more answers, and make everybody suspicious of each other. But it will cost us our privacy, our liberties, our freedom to travel, trade, and associate, and our diversity. In the final analysis, these are the things that constitute the greatest strength of our two countries. Thank you all very much. In the tradition of the Canada-America Business Council, uh, we're now going to turn to the next phase, which is Scotty Greenwood, our executive director, is going to have a little chat with the secretary, which we appreciate him agreeing to, and I'll turn it over to you, Scotty.
Thank you, Derek. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and Mr. Ambassador. Uh, it's terrific to be here, and we very much appreciate your insights. Uh, the Secretary let me know, uh, just as we were sitting there, that he'd be happy to take some questions from the room. Uh, so I have some questions, uh, but perhaps you have questions as well. So please be thinking of them, and we will just uh, do it as long as the schedule permits. And I would also say, Derek talks about the tradition of dialogue that we have, and so for anybody that's tweeting, or I guess, yik yakking, which is new to me, uh, it's hashtag CABC Dialogues. So I'm just going to kick it off, as I said, with a couple of questions, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you talked about sort of the two sides of Homeland Security, or two missions, one being security, which is awfully um, serious and um, probably keeps you up at night. Uh, and then you talked about the commercial relationship, which is, as you and the ambassador said, is the largest in the world. Um, I'm just wondering, we, we at the Canadian American Business Council spend a lot of time um, with Homeland Security because what happens at the border really does impact commerce. Um, so can you sort of elaborate on how do you thread the needle between um, the security mandate, which is awfully important, and then what I would call economic security, which I think is also extraordinarily important. I wonder if you could elaborate. I would begin by saying that because of technology, resources, and what I believe to be the sophistication with which we bring to the border port security effort, how it's evolving, how we are evolving to a risk-based approach to border security, that border security and facilitating lawful trade and travel does not have to be an either-or proposition. I think that we're pretty sophisticated in our screening of passengers, cargo, vehicles, and the like, that we are able to set aside things in the high-risk category while facilitating um, trade, travel, passage through our borders uh, in the category of low risk. You get put in the low risk category, you can still get pulled out of the low risk category. If you're in, if you're in TSA pre-check, for example, and you're going through the shorter line, we still, on a random basis, with some methodology, methodology going into, can pull you out of the TSA pre-check line for secondary screening. But I, as I see it, how things are evolving, it's not, and it does not need to be an either or proposition. When I took office, the first impulse when you're in a job like mine and we read the daily intelligence reports, we look at the world situation, first impulse is we got to shut that down. We got to stop that. We can't have any risk uh, of anything. But there's a cost to doing that. Uh, there's a cost to doing that for the traveling public. Um, just like I said, I could build you a perfectly safe city, I could build you a perfectly safe commercial air flight. But every one of you will not be allowed to wear any clothes. <laughs> you will not be allowed any carry-on luggage. You will not be allowed to get up. You will not have any food and no utensils, uh, no electronics, no nothing. And I will eliminate all the risk, but I don't think that that's a very acceptable way of, of traveling. So. Um, we try to be smart about this and strike a balance between aviation security, and we've had to make some enhancements lately, and doing so without unnecessarily burdening the traveling public. And <clears throat> I think TSA does a good job, our TSA does a good job of that. Um, I appreciate the level-headedness of John Pistol, our TSA administrator. Um, and so, just as I said at the end of my prepared remarks, it really is striking a balance. When I speak to U.S. audiences, I say it's striking a balance between security and our values as Americans who cherish the freedom to associate, to travel, their privacy. Um, and we, we have to hold on to those things. Those things are important. 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you talk about um, the progress made in facilitating commerce, um, one of the things that we've been working on, we've been working behind the scenes on, on beyond the border and regulatory cooperation. We think that the traveling, the business travel and the traveling public works pretty well. We think the progress is slower on the goods side at the border, and part of it um, we think is a sort of technology. So we're, we're uh, brainstorming with officials in the White House and PCO and across the agencies, including yours, about could you have a hackathon? Could you get somebody like Amazon.com or Uber to design uh, the interface? Uh, so that's, that's just a little idea um, that, that we're floating. But let me move on to something that's related but probably more complicated. How do the airlines feel about that? <laughs> well, anyway. Derek will have a rebuttal right, in a minute. Right, yeah. uh, uh, but related to what you were talking about and what you said in your speech is, is a more modern trucks and trains and, and people going across the border uh, is as long as we've lived on the continent. Um, but something that's more modern and um, perhaps more challenging and would love your thoughts on um, is the whole, you talked about critical infrastructure and cyber. Uh, we see cyber attacks and cyber uh, uh, there's a lot of cyber things that we don't see. So I wonder if you could talk uh, some about that and, and, and your insights there into, into what the challenge is and what you're doing to deal with it. Well, first, when I meet with foreign counterparts or even state and local counterparts in the United States, mayors, governors, cybersecurity is always on the list of topics to be discussed, areas of concern. And there's an increasing awareness which is good, across the entire planet about the need for cybersecurity. Um, <clears throat> there needs to be an increasing awareness, not so much among the most sophisticated businesses, the largest, most sophisticated in the financial services industry, for example, um, <clears throat> but those downstream in the supply chain who are less sophisticated about cyber hygiene and so forth. Um, we have work to do in the .gov world in the U.S. government. DHS is responsible for securing the .gov world in the U.S. government with the exception of .mil, the military and the intelligence community. Um, and we're responsible for coordinating the U.S. government's effort in the .com world. And what that means for even the most sophisticated Cyber security, cyber secured company is information sharing, sharing of best practices. And I think we do a pretty good job within DHS, certainly, of information sharing with the private sector on a rapid basis. The cybersecurity experts at DHS are on a first name basis with the cybersecurity experts in the largest companies in the U.S. And there is a certain amount of legal uncertainty that has to be resolved, in my judgment. What is the private sector's legal authority and freedom to share information with the .gov world free of any potential civil liability? What is the legal authority for DHS to patrol the .gov world? And so, there's legislation pending in our Congress right now, which I hope will pass, that has bipartisan support to provide clarity in these areas, to provide DHS with enhanced hiring capability in the cyber world. I'm competing against all of you for cyber talent, uh, which is not a good thing. Though I encourage young people coming out of graduate schools to spend a couple of years serving their country and gaining the experience of cybersecurity in the .gov world before they go work for um, large, large businesses. Um, so there are a number of pieces of legislation pending in our Congress that I hope will pass, and will pass even in the lame duck session when they come back into session after the midterms. You're an optimist. I am an optimist, yes. Um, this is, this is for us, and I believe for both our countries, a national imperative. We face cyber attacks from a range of actors on a daily, hourly basis. It's not just a cybersecurity threat, it's an ongoing series of attacks. And so one of my, if I had to reduce to uh, you know, three or four top priorities while I'm in office as secretary, 
of Homeland Security, this would be one of them. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, the thing about cyber is it knows no boundaries, and I was struck by your remarks, Mr. Secretary, about how what happens in Syria uh, is a homeland security matter. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means to me, at least, is that uh, Nebraska Avenue, where your campus is, uh, how did you know that? Do <laughs> doesn't doesn't you just been there, have you? <laughs> I meet with your people. They're terrific. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we're about dialogue, public sector. It's not the most sector. luxurious place in the it's world. It's not. So, okay. uh, but it's, it's hardworking people. Anyway, uh, they, what I was going to say is you deal not just with the homeland, not just with domestic things, but now increasingly international. Um, you, it seems to me De Department of Homeland Security touches uh, faraway countries. So here you are in Canada. Maybe you could talk for a minute uh, about the broad Canada-U.S. relationship and how you see it, and what uh, what finally compelled you to come, come to back. Canada to here. Yeah. Well, um, from the outset, it was made clear to me that uh, the U.S.-Canadian relationship is very, very important, uh, and that I, as the Secretary of Homeland Security, have a very large role in fostering that relationship. And we have so many common missions. We have so much stuff going on together, uh, not just the shared border, but our shared interest in cybersecurity, counterterrorism, um, aviation security, that it, it's critical that I um, help build that relationship. So I spoke to Minister Blaney within probably a week of taking office. Uh, I have met or spoken with him in nine months, probably about five times. Um, I've met with, I met with your prime minister, the Canadian prime minister, twice now, uh, here and in Mexico when we had our North American Leaders Summit mm -hmm. earlier this year. And so <clears throat> we're next door neighbors and we have a lot of business together and Homeland Security is a large part of that relationship. So. Couldn't it's, agree more. It's a, yeah. it's a relationship that I intend to spend a lot of time participating in. We're delighted, we're delighted that you are, and we're glad you're here. Um, with that, I could talk all day. Uh, this is kind of fun. But, but I think the Secretary would be really interested, um, not just in what I want to ask, but maybe what anybody in the room wants to ask. So, um, OK. Um, I see a few hands up. Uh, the gentleman right here, you could just, if, if anybody has a microphone. We do have a microphone. Uh, here it comes. I'm a former actor, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> Please identify yourself if you would. There's another one on the way soon. Great questions, thank you so much. The reality is that with um, severe weather events and aging infrastructure, that creates more of a challenge to responding to natural disasters. That's the reality. I think that FEMA, Federal Emergency um, uh, a, a federal Management. Emergency Management uh, Agency, emergency response. I'm sorry, I'm getting FEMA wrong. Um, um, 
it has come a long days from the days of Katrina under the leadership of Craig Fugate, FEMA's administrator. Katrina was 2005, and now I think the organization, there are always going to be a hic some hiccups given the speed with which we have to respond. But now I am remarkably impressed with the speed with which FEMA responds to events. FEMA can mobilize, I've seen this just on my watch, we had an, we had an ice storm in, in eastern Georgia in February, and FEMA within a very short period of time had mobilized something like a million emergency meals, uh, hundreds of thousands of bottles of water uh, in the event that people in Georgia needed it. Uh, they mobilized hundreds of generators for power outages. The U.S. Army could take a lesson from FEMA and how fast they mobilize stuff. And when you go to disaster assistance places, and I've been to a couple now, uh, Washington State, where we had this big mudslide in March, Arkansas in May, where we had, a, we had a few tornadoes, and you watch the FEMA coordinate the federal response. It is really impressive how well-coordinated the federal response is with the state response, the local response, the neighbors, um, and more than one elected official has said to me as we're leaving the site, this is what our federal government does the best now. So I, I, I really do think that FEMA is in a really good place with Craig's leadership. I think he's doing a wonderful job. Um, the best indicator of that when I go to an affected area to inspect the cleanup, and I'm wearing my FEMA jacket. Every politician in the state wants to be, in the, wants to be on the site with me, irrespective of where they are on the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Every politician in the state wants to be there. Um, so <clears throat> there are always going to be challenges. There are, uh, unfortunately, there are always going to be disasters that we could not prevent. We try to minimize them. We minimize the impact of them. That's one of the reasons we have. FEMA preparedness grants, but I think the organization has come a long way in the last nine years. You know, Mr. Secretary, you talk about the politicians getting together. The image I have in my mind is with President Obama and Governor Chris Christie, uh, where they said, and, you know, we'll cut through all the red tape. And actually, uh, Spectra Energy is here. And one of the amazing things that happened after Hurricane Sandy is it was Canadian crews that were closer uh, that could help secure the gas lines mm -hmm. um, than the crews that would have had to come from Louisiana or Oklahoma. So. Um, so in addition to FEMA, we really appreciate the work that your department's doing on resilience across the Canada-U.S. border. So anyway. Um, um, Mr. Let's see. questions? Yes, sir. Uh, introduce yourself, Barry McLaughlin. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Where's the mic? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Larger question on labor mobility, which is related, you know. I, I have to look at that. We allow non-U.S. citizens into the U.S. military, so. So we'll take a look at that. Um, I see that people in the back with pads. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing you're not part of the uh, business council, but I welcome a question. Uh, as long as you, you keep your voice up, you're all the way in the back. Uh, so. 
Mr. Secretary, it's uh, Bob Fife from CTV News. Um, I, you met with the Prime Minister. You're, you've talked about the dangers of um, homegrown terrorism and, Canadi and Americans and Canadians leaving to go and fight overseas with uh, terrorist groups. What specific measures can Canada, additional specific measures that Canada and the United States can take together to prevent them from going overseas uh, and to stop um, the radicalization of uh, Canadian and American youth. And I know one of the measures we've looked at uh, are exit controls. Are there other additional measures? Thanks, Bob. Well, I know that the Canadian government is thinking about this issue. Uh, I know that um, the ministers that I've spoken with are thinking about this issue. Um, my answer to your question would be information sharing, um, lawful, appropriate information sharing. And <clears throat> I think that there is some progress to be made in that regard across the spectrum in terms of information sharing, not just between the U.S. government and the Canadian government, but between us and our European allies. Um, and that was one of the reasons for the U.N. Security Council resolution that passed last week on foreign fighters. Um, I think that we could each learn some lessons about countering violent extremism at home. So for example, when I was in Columbus, Ohio last week, um, there was a mayor from um, a moderate-sized city from Belgium who was there to kind of observe the exercise, um, wanted to see how we ran these programs. And so I think that there are lessons learned by each country from observing how other countries um, do outreach to counter violent extremism. The one thing I'd add to that, from my point of view, <clears throat> the most successful, what we call CVE programs, that's the acronym, Countering Violent Extremism, the most successful CVE programs are those where the government manages to build a degree of trust across a spectrum of issues. It's not just you go to the community and you say, please tell your people not to become terrorist. Um, it's a relationship across the spectrum of issues. There are lots of issues that community organizations want to talk to me about. Immigration issues, aviation security uh, issues, uh, issues with uh, TSA. And so we try to build trust across a range of issues so that if there's a problem that somebody in a community organization hears about, we've established a relationship where they, they let us know about the potential problem. So, uh, I think I have time for one more question. Could, could I perhaps ask you, sir, uh, Catherine Cullen from the CBC? I'm wondering, there's been, yes, a, lot of, there's been a lot of rhetoric around uh, describing the threat that ISIS poses. I wonder what your sense is of how big a threat it poses to Canada. ISIL represents a serious potential threat, and I'm speaking in terms of the U.S. homeland, um, to the U.S. homeland for a number of reasons. Um, and I have to believe that um, <clears throat> a number of those reasons are shared um, with respect to, to, the, to this country. Um, they've acquired territory in Iraq and Syria. When a terrorist organization acquires territory, that's, that's never a good thing, from which to train, launch attacks, recruit, um, command and control. Uh, they've demonstrated a willingness to kill innocent hostages for the purpose of making a point in a depraved and public manner. Uh, they've demonstrated a skill with social media, propaganda. Uh, they take in an excess of a million dollars a day in revenue from, from illicit oil, from, from kidnapping and other things. And um, they, they have a reach that um, is, is, is quite concerning. So we've decided, and the international community has decided, that we need to take the fight to this organization. Um, and an international coalition is being built around that right now. And then there are a number of other things that we're doing in our homeland um, to address potential threats to our homeland across a range of um, threat streams. And so it's, it's simply something we have to do. 
Okay, one more question. I saw a question way over in the back, in the corner. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you come forward just a little bit? Right up here. <laughs> Don't be shy. You're going to make her regret asking this I question, know. aren't you? <laughs> right. She's thinking of a better question while she's walking up here. Well, in general, I think we're doing a pretty good job, um, but we have to, and I'm, I'm being general here, um, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, part, of, part of this interest can be served by the Beyond the Borders initiative. Um, so I think we're doing a better job, and we have to continue the effort. We have to continue the progress. And I'm not just talking about U.S. and Canada either. I think we we have this conversation with a range of our good friends and allies. Um, and it's, it's, I view it as, as very, very important to the homeland security of a number of countries. Thank you all very much. Thank you.